The future is a concept. It doesn't exist. As the proverb says, tomorrow never comes. There is no such thing as tomorrow. There never will be. Because time is always now. Welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast. The podcast about the stuff we wonder about and other things. All right, we are here with Dr. Michael Sapiro, uh, founding teacher of Montre Sangha Boise, director of Montre House Yoga, where he serves his community through meditation, psychology, and noetic sciences. How are you doing today, Michael? Good. Thanks for having me on your show. No problem. Um, so a lot to talk about here. Um, why don't you go ahead and maybe start out by telling us a little bit, a little bit about the philosophy of Kashmir Shaivism. I know that you practice for some time as a monk, I believe. Is that correct? Um, that was in the Thai forest tradition. So oh, okay. my, my training in the Kashmir Shaivism lineage is a, is a yogic philosophy, yogic meditation training. Um, that's specific uh, through my teacher, Richard Miller. And then I've spent over 20 some years studying Buddhism in a variety of lineages. And the one that I've spent the last 15 years in, or almost 15 years, is the Thai forest tradition, the Vipassana and Theravada traditions um, of Southeast Asia. And so, uh, which one is more appealing to you uh, to talk about? And, you know, what it's so broad. So what, what would you like to really well, get um, So I'll chime in a little bit. I'm Ashley Grimes. I'm, you know, an attorney. I do a lot of corporate law, but I've worked in several areas, try to do some pro bono um, work. I'm really interested in, you know, psychological and uh, social sciences. Uh, mm -hmm. So what piqued my interest was more the noetic sciences and kind of what that encompasses and, you know, your knowledge on that base. Um, Skylar might have a different interest, but that's, that's what I'm definitely interested in for Great. sure. Mm -hmm. So the noetic sciences, which is uh, the science of consciousness, science of transformation, science of human potential, um, noetic meaning knowledge, but not intellectual knowledge, a, a knowledge that you gain through an, an experience, a deep, a deep experiential understanding of something of the universe. And that's a noetic experience that you, and so the sciences study what happens uh, to the brain, to energy systems, to our body, to matter around us as we have these experiences. And um, so that's that's yours. How about Skylar? Like, what what's your interest? Because then I can tailor this to that. I am fascinated by just world religions in general. I'm kind mm -hmm. of obsessed with the Bible, and you know, we go to church and we study the Bible. We I love to listen to podcasts about Buddhism, different mm -hmm. philosophies all over, and I'm open to you know just learning and educating myself on different ideas and pretty much. Great. So. Maybe the, the place that I think would be good to start from is a, my conceptualization, my understanding of the, the way human beings understand themselves in relationship to the world, others, and then the universe, and then possibly even source, whatever source might mean. And when you sent me all the list of things you'd like us to talk about, I had to think about a map, how to all, because there's a variety of subjects you wanted to cover in this session. And um, they each have a place in our understanding of ourselves and our, the way we take care of ourselves in relationship to the world, others, and then source. And so the way I conceive of this is we're human beings that have a really tough time being quiet and still enough to really touch that place of peace and love from which we all come from. And I don't know what to call that. For me in meditation, it's really a, an expansive field that has no form that I find myself arising out of, my sensations, my perceptions and beliefs. The thing that you call Mike is um, arising from a kind of formless field and when I dissolve into that field through meditation, I find that field to be rich and vibrant and just pure love, not human to human love, but a love that's expansive and unconditioned. There's no condition for it. 
because I love you or I want something from you. I love you. That's a human thing uh, because we've, you know, we're partnered and there's oxytocin and bonding. There's, there's perceived love. Uh, so this is a, a deeper, more unconditioned love. Um, so many of us because of traumas and depression, anxiety, and, and, you know, issues maybe with poverty and that, that keep us from taking care of ourselves. Uh, we struggle to connect to this source. And so the things you're asking me to talk about Ayurveda, the science of Ayurveda medicine, um, noetic sciences, all of these practices are ways in which we cleanse and refine ourselves to a point where we can actually have more contact with the source that we're coming from. So are the, is the Ayurvedic text, is that derived from the Upanishads or is that? The, the Ayurvedic texts come from various Vedas, the, the Rig Veda and, and, and Vedas that are said to be 5,000 years old. And these are texts that talk about the body is no different than nature. And so understanding qualities of nature, when the body has disease, then we look to nature to figure out where balance occurs in nature because our bodies are made of the same molecules. We have the same elements, bile, fire, water, earth, density. We have air, we breathe. And so, mm -hmm, go ahead. I was gonna um, how does the doshas tie? I know there's the, refer to the doshas, and what exactly are the doshas, and how does that tie into the? Well, doshas are are kind of physiological temperament. So some of us have more fire. Uh, we have we're prone to gastric issues. We're we're angry. We can be intense. We have um, rashes, and then some of us get lightheaded, and that they're we're airy and spacey in our minds and we have lots of gas and arthritis in our knuckles. And so the doshas are essentially what, how we're formed, particularly what nature elements are more dominant in our body. So when one dosha is on, is, is not um, um, fully balanced or it's in balance with other ones, then we look to nature to go, well, how do you balance too much fire? How do you balance too much bile in the gastric, the GI tract? And so you look for remedies that are balancing what doshas are imbalanced. And the reason you do that is one, because we don't want to live in disease and our bodies, um, the more disease we have, the less we can pay attention because our minds are focused on disease and illness, but also because this is the only vessel we have for our consciousness. If we're not taking care of our bodies, uh, our consciousness becomes dull or tampered with. You know, like people who drink a lot, their minds are very dull, and um, it's hard to pay attention, concentrate. Um, it's hard to follow through with the things they're thinking. They can't. You know, people who are in, intoxicated are, are clearly not in balance, right? And so, what happens when you put wrong foods or for your body? You also have similar kind of dysfunctions of the mind. So the reason Ayurveda is so important is because it teaches us how to really take care of this vessel which houses our consciousness, which is the most precious gift we've been given as human beings. It's actually, the concepts are really simple. Putting them into practice is very difficult. You know, I spent four years with one teacher really learning I have a few Ayurvedic teachers, um, and I one particularly really learning how to listen to my body. They're all experiments. Ayurveda is a set science that only works when you're experimenting and feeling the impact in your own body. And when you feel imbalanced and when you start using some me medicines or remedies, you see the, how you start feeling different and how the mind becomes clearer, sharper more insight, more wisdom is that you have access to. So in essence, you know, when I lived in Thailand, there's a lot of um, grandma's tales about foods that you eat when you're sick. But the truth is that's what you eat when you're sick, you know, and they work because your body's like, oh, this is what I need. I need bitter right now to cool down my fever. And you don't need to rely most of the time on external out 
sourcing of chemicals uh, derived from similar molecules because nature is providing it. That doesn't mean we shouldn't seek cancer treatment when we have cancer, you know, or medications when we need them. But I am saying that we have a world, a, a dearth of world knowledge that are already built into Ayurvedic principles. And that's just from India. Thailand has its own medicinal, you know, practices. China does too. Native American, Native indigenous populations here have their own medicines from the uh, plants around them. Um, so it's about listening to the body while you're taking these and seeing where, where that balance point is and then how that impacts the mind. Because in the end, the whole idea of any yogic tradition or Buddhist tradition is really aligning with the source from which we're coming from, which Buddhism may call it emptiness, but it's emptiness of um, concepts. It's not emptiness of vitality in life. It's emptiness of a concept of Mike. Mike doesn't exist the way we think Mike exists. So that's how Ayurveda and taking care of the body ties into the deeper concepts of yoga, Kashmir Shaivism, and Buddhism too. And you, you own a restaurant, a Thai restaurant as well too. Do you? Um, my, uh, food truck, catering, uh, oh. workshops, festivals. We don't have a brick and mortar because we like to travel. Yeah, that's the way to do it. We have a really nice food truck. Uh, we're at all the markets here in Boise, festivals, concerts, things like that. And then, so how did the sutras tie into your practice and what is a sutra exactly? Sutra traditionally means thread, something that ties ideas or concepts together. So it depends on which suttas in, in, in Pali or sutras in Sanskrit you're talking about, if they're yogic or Buddhist, there are essentially teachings that give us information how to practice so that we can have peace, well-being, ease. So it's a man, they're manuals for living, whether they talk about the importance of right speech, the importance of right livelihood, or relating to people, or whether they talk about uh, cultivating skills through meditation and mindfulness and then the yogic ones they're all very similar it, they're different traditions yogic and Buddhist are different but in the end they really somewhat point to very similar teachings of working on ourselves, refining ourselves, changing our behavior so that we're aligned with our deeper values we're taking care of other people in need we're taking care of ourselves in need and we're finding ultimate peace and well-being by letting go of the hold we have on our ideas and beliefs about the world because they're mostly wrong yeah. and conditioned. Yeah. So, so with the Institute of Noetic Sciences, is that kind of the stuff that you guys are working on kind of studying or? Uh, not at all. No. They, are, <laughs> they are really studying, in essence, really extraordinary or super normal states of human existence telepathy clairvoyance experiences of transcendence and oneness um, the interaction between the mind and and this matter around us experiences of near death uh, what happens when people have near-death experiences what happens to consciousness um, things like artificial intelligence and virtual reality how does that shift our understanding of consciousness and, and the universe around us Noetic Science, Institute of Noetic Sciences is really forward thinking about the, the more frontier experiences that human beings have. We all have them, we just don't often talk about them. So if I'm leading a group and I'm asking, how many of you had the experience of knowing, of thinking about somebody and then literally that moment or the next moment they call or text you? Coincidence? Totally, possibly, you know, completely. Over and over again, it, Statistically, that changes from coincidence and chance to what is happening. Like, what, how am I facilitating this connection? Or how am I open to these greater connections through space and time? Studying something like that is what Institute of Noetic Science does. And the reason I love it so much is because don't we want to know our potential as human beings? Don't we, we want to know what the far-reaching expansive potential is for us we're going to be living on mars eventually what happens to human consciousness in space don't we want to know what kind of gifts we have to use in a completely 
a different world than we're living in now and even here on earth. The reason we want to cultivate this is because the better we know ourselves, the hopefully the more skillful we get at taking care of each other. That's the hope. So you piqued my interest when you said telepathy. What kind of uh, stuff do you guys have going on with that? Well, Dean Radin, the chief scientist, and anybody listening to this podcast can look him up. Dean Radin has done quite an extensive amount of work on telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition. That's mind-to-mind -mind interaction. It's not as, it's not as um, s s paranormal as you think. I mean, when I'm with my patients and I'm really focused on my patients, I can start hearing what they're thinking, not full sentences, but I catch words. I'm like, I'm like, did you just think this? And they're like, ah, do you know? I'm like, I'm just paying attention. Sometimes facial gestures might give things away to me, but other times I'm actually really tuned in and hearing what they're thinking very simply and i can't make it happen i can't go okay now i'm going to stare hard and make it happen it's really when i'm in the flow and paying attention and attuning deep attunement to another human being and i'm in their space where i start hearing the things they're thinking about i'm not special i'm not you know in terms of like i haven't cultivated this specifically with teachers but it's something i recognize that happens when i'm doing my work a lot of other people, when they're close, have this. One, one time, my wife and I were laying together, quiet for 30 minutes in bed, just quiet. And our heads touched, just on the pillow, our heads touched. And I started singing a song that apparently was in her head. Uh -huh. We have that happen all the time. When you're really synced with someone in tune, you start literally knowing what they're thinking. We had another experience quiet for half an hour in the car ride all of a sudden i was thinking about giraffes for no reason don't know why and i said something about a giraffe and she's like i've been thinking about a zoo for the last 10 minutes and i'm like oh man this stuff happens quite often when you pay attention you know yeah. have, have you guys had that experience you, yeah, we you know we we are obviously you know kind of different because i tend to be analytical but i have a really artistic side he has a very heavily artistic side. And so when we have these things happen, um, I'm so in, interested in communication theory and kind of mm -hmm. you know, what external factors could trigger that or, you know, we've been driving in the car and the same thing, you know, a song will come into my head and he'll start humming it <laughs> <laughs> or vice versa. I'm going, did we hear that on the radio or, you know, and so of course I love, picking it apart and going, did we see something, you know, was there something that we experienced and we weren't as conscious of what we saw, you know, passing, driving on the road. And mm -hmm. because we're so similar, um, it, I think it's spirit. Does that happen? So it's, it's really intriguing. Uh, mm -hmm. Just understanding that relationship and how that happens. So. Well, here, here's the way I think about it. And, and I'm not right in my thinking. It's just something I'm um, uh, think about through the, the time I've been doing this work. A couple things. One, have you ever been in a room and an angry person comes in the room and you feel that person's presence? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> have you ever known someone was staring at you from a distance? That, almost that feeling where, you know, the hair right. was raised, right? And yeah, right. Turn around and even though they're behind you out of your, you know. Out of your uh, conscious mm -hmm awake aware zone mm -hmm. you have a sense somehow that you're being stared at uh, i think animals have a greater sense of that so um my dog my wife and i play with my dog sometimes he's way out in the backyard through with through the glass we see him and we pretend we don't see him he's turned away and we both turn our heads and look at him and from way across the yard through a pane of glass he always turns his head and look right at us huh. right so x-rays go through bone x-rays go through matter your skull is not in, is is not impervious is that the word it, it can be permeated it can be your skull is not a barrier that can't have x-rays going through it so why wouldn't thoughts or energy or the energy of a thought not go through your brain and be picked up also so when you're thinking of a song and your partner picks up that song and hums, 
if an x-ray can go through your, this is just hypothesis. I'm not saying this is true. So whoever's listening, oh, this is bullshit. I mean, maybe, <laughs> but we have studies on dogs awareness of picking things up and animals awareness. What are we picking up when someone's staring at the back of our head? Because there's, you don't see any matter doesn't mean there's not extra, actually an occurrence of energy shifting and moving from one place to another that you can perceive. So why wouldn't thoughts and songs be per perceived? Of course yeah. they could be. I so. think it makes sense. I mean, we are electromagnetic beings. I think that sometimes if we think a thought, we're generating an electromagnetic signature in our brain and that possibly that could be picked up at a distance from somebody else's brain. Sure. It's kind of like an antenna receiving that signal. Well, then so you this, look at, yeah. go ahead. No, please, go ahead. You look at nature and I love studying how insects behave and how mammals behave and just because like you said they kind of pick up on things that for the most part humans can't pick up and you know for instance ants will build an entire colony and their way of communicating is it can be through smell it can be through different signals and it's so interesting and then you get into uh, uh, fungi you know and how there are these deep rooted i mean entire networks of of these beings that are communicating in a way that we can't understand. Mm -hmm. yes, and so, exactly. you know, it calls to question, especially with technology, it's so interesting because now we have, you know, communication where it's an electronic signal that is sent and it's decoded and, you know, you see a picture on your screen and, mm -hmm. you know, people who work with coding understand that a lot more, but you start to get into the philosophical Part of that and you think okay how deep can that go mm -hmm. and is it technology that we haven't discovered yet or something that we um we have around us but we just haven't yet defined it or coined a term to kind of identify what it is right mm -hmm. You're right and so thinking about this i the rationale or the explanation i gave is very materialistic i'm what i'm saying is there's a there's a, a explanation in our material world that can account for what's happening but I don't think that's the cause of what's happening. That's just the explanation of the physical, uh, um, the physical modality or I can't, mechanism of that happening. So if you look at a radio, it's very clear to those who build it how it works, but you can't find the voice in the radio. There's nowhere you can look that you'll find the voice. So I'm not suggesting that there isn't something deeper going on that's consciousness oriented. I'm just saying, the more we get technology advances in looking at electromagnetic signals of thoughts, of emotions, how does emotions impact the field around us? We'll have a better understanding of how it happens, but not why. I love that because the why is really a deeper philosophical, spiritual question. Um, but what I was trying to do is normalize some of these things like telepathy, clairvoyance, having uh, an image in your head before the thing shows up or uh, you know, or having a feeling something's going to happen and it does. These are real phenomena human beings have. So Noetic Sciences is just studying that. The Institute of Noetic Sciences is looking at that. On that point, um, I'll tell you a personal experience. So three years ago, I had a rollover accident where the car flipped three times mm -hmm. and I was conscious the entire time. I didn't pass out and the car flipped upside down and you know, this goes into trauma and just how this happens and how our brains process everything. And the second time it flipped, I remember in my head thinking, oh my gosh, this car is flipping. But it took the second flip for me to mm -hmm. have that thought. And everything was so slow. Mm -hmm. And then the third time it flipped, I thought, this is it. I have to accept, you know, I'm dying. And it, it was this weird, I mean, I was peaceful about it. I was going, okay, this is, this is my time to go. And the car stops and it slides and I'm still alive and I'm going, okay, well, surely a car is going to run into me because I'm on the freeway and that's going to be it. So I'm still going to die. Mm -hmm. Well, car stops. Um, I realized that no other cars are hitting my car. So <laughs> now I'm just going, I've got to get out because I smelled something burning. I was in a Honda Insight. So I kicked the window I had heels on and I kicked it about three times and then I crawled out. I didn't feel anything. Um, no pain whatsoever, you know, adrenaline, whatever. And I get out of the car, go off to the side 
by the time we got to the hospital, I had actually embedded glass in my knee as I was crawling out and didn't even feel it. But there's this strange thing with, with something like that happening. You know, you go through all of these thought processes and, you know, accepting what it is and processing it afterwards. And it's just a really strange phenomenon to go through something like that. What do you make um, of it? So it was so strange because prior to that accident, where I was going is I had had dreams about the accident mm. probably four or five times. Um, I'm, I have dreams and I remember them really vividly. A lot of them, you know, <laughs> I go, well, that didn't make any sense. Um, but sometimes I'll write them down. And with this one, it was reoccurring. And when it happened, it, I mean, it was just so surreal because there was a second where I thought, am I dreaming again? You know, mm -hmm. I dreamed about it. And so after this happened, this is the first traumatic thing that's ever happened to me. Um, I had never understood depression. I had never understood um, trauma. You know, I, I thought, well, people aren't really anxious. You know, they must be faking it or there's no such thing as anxiety. I was just more, you know, practical. And that experience I went through, holy moly, I mean, you know, the kind of a, a depression for a mm -hmm. little bit. I had um, fear of driving on that freeway. You know, I would literally be in the passenger seat and clench the seat and close my eyes if someone else is driving. Mm -hmm. So, and I had to go, I went to a psychologist. Um, I went through my church, you know, because we both, you know, that's just what we turn to. But um and processing those feelings and the emotions and accepting that I had died. I think that was the hardest thing to process is my mind kind of settled that this is the end. And so when I lived on past that, mm -hmm. it was a really strange disconnect. And I, I had never, you know, thought of something like that happening. So today, I mean, it, it was an incredible experience because working through the feelings and working through the emotions and letting myself feel them. Um, because me personally, I, you know, I, I just don't believe in taking medication to process feelings because I think that the body is equipped, um, if you allow it to, to go through those emotions and, you know, you're supposed to kind of feel those emotions and, and learn something from it. Um, but it took a good three years, you know, of, of, you know, going to a psychologist, developing, personal relationships with individuals, diving into my career in certain aspects, um, taking on cases where I was able to kind of help people who had had similar things happen. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just amazing when things like that happen or I hear about that now, it's a really different perspective. It shifted. Well, that's, that's, that's what we call a noetic experience then. So it doesn't have to be a, 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 a oneness experience or a, a what we in mystic Christianity call a Christ consciousness, where you be you have that innate sense, not on here, but in here of your innate, deeper sense of connection to God, and that there's nothing outside of you; it all resides on the inside as well. Those are amazing, but more than not, people have near death experiences divorces, deaths of loved ones that wakes them up and shows them, one, the preciousness of life. It takes death for a lot of people to realize how precious this life really is. And then two, how much their pre-experience thinking was so limited and compacted, thinking that this is what we think, the, this is how the world is. And then you have a near-death experience and you have a whole new shifting of thinking. And all of a sudden you're like, I had no idea the world was this way too, that there's all these uncovered puzzle pieces of the universe. And because we don't have these experiences all the time, we're not always given the opportunity to challenge our own worldview, which is needed to liberate ourselves from that worldview, which keeps us from the thing we're seeking, which is peace or oneness or holiness. And because we're in our small little walnut shell floating on the ocean thinking, oh, this walnut shell is the ocean, is the, is the world. And then you open the walnut shell and you're just blown away by the vastness of the universe that is the ocean, if you're going with my metaphor. Yeah. 
So your near-death experience can be liberating. It can change. Not only that, you sound like you have empathy for people because how many people had that preset? You're not really, anxiety doesn't exist. Oh. Or, you know, <laughs> how devastating would it be to be, let's say to be your friend. And they're like, I'm really struggling with these low feelings of depression, of like apathy, low motivation. I can't get myself up. And you're like, just, just go exercise. You're just making all this up. And then they're like, oh, I'm ashamed and I'm not heard. But now you know, oh, this is real. People experience this. I am. And now your compassion and empathy is expanded. And you're going to be a better servant of people now than you were before your accident. That's on one hand, the practical sense of having these noetic experiences when you follow through with them. So um, in your practice, you know, traditionally, um, go to a doctor, they want to prescribe you something like an SSRI for depression. Um, how do you approach something like that if somebody comes to you? And Well, as a psychologist, I don't prescribe, although in Idaho, in Idaho, though, we're the fifth state in America to allow psychologists to prescribe because we're such a rural state. I have to take two more years of education and pharmacology, but Generally, though, I do have training in medicine because many of my patients are, are on medication. Um, I used to be against it because I had a small, narrow view that I thought was right. I was, grew up in a fairly healthy, naturopathic household. My dad and stepmom were very um, holistic in their foods and their medicines and their treatments. And so I thought, you know, people can work through their stuff without medication. Um, and then I went through my psychological training and spent time in a PTSD, traumatic brain injury clinic at a VA in California, spent time working at a homeless shelter in Oakland, crisis homeless shelter, uh, worked with severely mentally, uh, severe mental illness, like schizophrenia in daycare, you know, what we call a psychosocial rehab center. And I'm like, oh no, medications can be really useful at regulating and helping people function. People who have schizophrenia or bipolar can live without them, but much more difficult. Um, sometimes I suggest to patients, you know, six months of an antidepressant will actually help you during this treatment period. And then maybe you get enough energy, motivation, you're connected to yourself again, you find your self-worth, where those aren't as necessary. Some people need to stay on them longer. And it's a matter of teamwork, myself, the patient, and, and the prescribing doctor, of working with the patient's needs and understanding. But now, I'm, I mean, there's just they're, they're there for a reason. They're overused sometimes, but they're also really important. Um, and it's, it's a real stigma when I hear some people say, you know, I'm really against medication and they should just, they should just da-da-da-da. I'm like, that, that's shaming. That's a stigma you're putting on somebody now who's doing their best and needs some support because brain chemistry does uh, need some balancing for some people. It's just, it's, it's reality. So I tend to really try to let, uh, teach people about not having the stigma of medication. It's okay. Right. And I tend to agree with that. I, uh, for me, I'm against medication for myself because I feel like I have a good sense of my body and what I can handle. But there are, there are people who kind of opened my mind to that because, you know, I have a friend who, when I was going through, you know, dealing with the trauma and all of that, you know, you talk to people and say, Hey, what worked for you? What did you do? Um, one of my friends who I absolutely respect and admire and adore, she disclosed to me, you know, I had to go on an antidepressant for a year and then she went off of it. And, you know, she's a very strong, I mean, incredible person. And she said it really helped me. And so that really changed my view because I'm going, okay, so, you know, it's all about, like you said, some people can take it to the extreme. And I think that gives um, the individuals who really need the medication, it stigmatizes it, right? Mm -hmm. Negatively. Um, because in some cases, you know, it, it kind of gives that extra, uh, you know, time frame to to cope with something or sure. to yeah. 
to handle. So. so if you think, remember my whole emphasis is awakening the person, liberating from the bonds of conditioning so that we see clearly who we are and so we have a really rich, deep connection already present in the moment to the thing we're seeking most. And people call that God or source, but we're all seeking a deep relationship to where we're coming, where we've come from and to the universe around us or to the power that created the universe around us. But when you have a clouded mind, it's like looking through a window that's stained glass. You can't really see clearly. You see, you see shades and textures and colors based on your conditioning, your mental habits, your ancestry, your DNA, and it becomes hard. So let's say someone has a, a, mental, dis a mental illness or a mental issue in which medicine will help them see more clearly. Are you, you know, if you're a holistic person you're, and your window is terribly dirty, you can spit as much as you want and try to clean that. Sometimes Windex is really just the right thing. <laughs> at that right moment. That's a good way to put it. You know, you're like, I'm just going to not go green for a second. I'm going to clean this window. All right. You know, there, everything has a purpose. Right. Are you aware of um, the uh, Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Research? Yeah. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What's your take on, I think they're trying or attempting to open up trials for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. I was kind of curious what your take was on that. Uh, yeah, they're, I believe, in the third phase. The FDA just got back to them saying, as far as I know, they can do some clinics, but very, very limited numbers. I actually had applied, um, I had applied to be one of those therapists to get training, uh, but because of the FDA's restrictions, they're, they're not going as national as they wanted to. Um, do I agree with it? I think everything has a place. I think if we're cautious and we're mindful about how we're doing our science and our research and really carefully monitoring people, I am good with plant medicines. I'm good with synthetic medicines if they help people stabilize, awaken, function, and then thrive. I personally, as a teacher, a healer, and a therapist, I would ultimately prefer people to rely on their own practices, spiritual practices, contemplative prayer, being in community, dancing, singing, drumming, meditation that awakens them to their fullest potential. I would rather them do that more throughout the year than just do an MDMA treatment for PTSD. So do the MDMA treatment, get stabilized, find your well-being and now integrate that the rest of your life with spiritual practices um, because I think ultimately we're still responsible for ourselves, um, our own healing and thriving. So I am for psychedelic assisted therapy because I believe in those medicines, um, but I'm more for integrated care afterward because that's where it's to sustained. And you're, you're really big on meditation as well, is that correct? Yeah, 22 years as a student, maybe 16, 17 years teaching. Um, it is the most, for me, the most profound practice of so many things. I mean, you have simple connect, connection to yourself with breath and body scans. You have ability to train your mind to focus on what you're doing. You have the ability to train your mind to concentrate. So not just bring your mind in and it wanders, bring it in, but bring it in and it stays there. I can literally look at a patient for 50 minutes and just a few times have some thoughts, have some images, but really concentrate looking at my patient because I've spent all this time. Think about the power of presence when you're sitting with someone who's attending to you like you're the most important person in the world. That's medicinal by itself. So me training meditation is giving me the ability to attend to somebody and let them know they are the most precious person right now in my and their life. And then you have meditation practices that help you dissolve beyond the boundaries of your thinking self, your conceptual self. It's a very, very profound um, way of being when you take meditation into the world. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting, I've never heard it quite 
click that way um, because, you know, typically, you know, we talk about meditation, prayer, kind of the difference and all of that, um, similarities, you know, mm -hmm. and there can be that inward focus. And I think, um, you know, there's some realm of thought where, you know, there's more of an inner focus versus the way that you put it is meditating to kind of be there for the patient. And, you know, what sounds to me that you're saying is kind of calming your mind, um, calming your thoughts of yourself so that you can really be attentive to that individual because the, the therapeutic value of that is just so profound. So That's one, yeah, mm -hmm. one of the many benefits is when you do such deep inward work, you have a chance then to radiate that outward toward everybody. And, and everyone who does this, not everyone, it's hyperbole, but <laughs> people who do such inward work and really clean lenses that they're seeing the world with, we all have inner light. I mean, it, I don't know how to measure it. I, I don't need to say it scientifically, but when you're around present people, there's a lightness. There's literally light. I mean, I've heard people saying, when I'm around a very present person, the room gets lighter. I feel light. That could be an exaggerated sense of love or care, or could actually be things shifting in space, like we were talking about earlier. So the more inner work we do, the more we radiate, and we're all becoming lamps around us. So when I teach meditation to a group, everybody comes in, they're in their own space. They just left their husband or wife for the hour. Their kids are at home. They're tired from working. And then they go inward, they feel their body, and they rest in awareness. And all of this life is happening, and they feel lighter. And they wait, they come out, and then they can look at each other and just be with each other without stories in front of them, between them, going on. And that is the most precious gift we can give each other is our presence. So meditation outwardly looks like presence. And then I also wanted to talk about um, purpose and meaning. So me and my friend were having kind of a conversation about this the other day. And his think on it was you basically can assign meaning to whatever you choose. And I wanted to get your thoughts on how you define meaning and purpose and how it looks for you. Mm. These are tough questions, right? Because not purpose. Purpose doesn't feel as tough as meaning. Right. To Can me. Can touch on that one first? Well, you know, I don't have other people's answers. Yeah. But I know when I'm living my purpose, I'm in flow. I, I find synchronicities happening, meaning like I'm thinking of someone and they call or, you know, these are little synchronicities when I'm living in my purpose and in my, my relationship to the source from which I come from or the universe, like everything happens. And even when it's painful and it's not the thing I want, there's, there's an, an inner knowing that this is, this is exactly right. It, even the painful things become in flow. So when I'm in my purpose, it's like those clouds part and you have a direct relationship to sun. It's very clear. I'm doing what I'm meant to do. I feel energized. I feel bright. I'm clear. I'm connecting to myself and other people. For me, my purpose is serving. It's all I do is I just serve. I keep serving. And when I'm tired at the end of the day and I've seen seven patients and then I have a meditation group that I'm tr trudging there. Oh, I just want to be with my dog. And I think, and I just think, just serve, just serve. And I sit down in that chair in front of 20 or 50 or 80 people and I light up and the right words come and people are nodding and then they're crying and then they're connecting. And I'm like, mm, just do my purpose. Even when I'm tired, just serve. Um, so there's a flow, there's aha moments, there's inspiration that happens and pain even is okay because it's like, yeah, this stinks, but it's, it's, it's okay. It's a part of my growth and transformation to be in this. So that for me, I can't tell you what other people's purpose should be, but for me, it's service. Um, meaning is interesting because who's making meaning? What part of us is creating meaning from what lens? 
you're always going to create meaning from a lens that you're thinking about. Or if you're savvy, you'll put on some other lens and you'll go, well, here's meaning from that lens. So it's a little bit more arbitrary in a way because we're creating something from a lens that's conditioned. What happens when you take off all of the lenses and an event occurs you don't have the thought, is there meaning in this or not? What does this mean? It doesn't matter anymore. There is no purpose in asking that question when all of those lenses have come off and you're purely being, witnessing life arising. Life arising is life living itself. And I don't have to ascribe meaning to it because life is doing it for itself. It's being lived. It's the universe living through itself. And that's meaning enough without me ascribing a single word to it. If you've ever been in nature and you've become so quiet and just watch the ripples or a passing stream and there's nothing but being, you're not thinking, what does this mean? And a star goes by at night, you're not going, is that a signal? It's a star going by at night because the star is expressing itself that way. The universe is living as a star passing by you. These are deeper moments that when you clean your window and you actually get rid of the window, there is no one thinking and no one, no one trying to figure anything out at that point. I absolutely, I love that just because, I mean, you know, in law school, we, we had someone come in and talk about, you know, meditation because there are professions where it's really high stress and finding mm -hmm. that, that thing that kind of grounds you and, keeps you at peace and balances everything out is so important. And, you know, uh, I probably drive my husband nuts because we have several different animals. Um, but for me, that's, that's how I kind of unwind. Mm -hmm. I can sit in a room with, you know, our cat or we have ducks in the yard and mm -hmm. I can just kind of watch them and doing simple things, you know, drinking water or swimming in the pond for the ducks or the cat, you know, just kind of sitting there and, you know, she'll look at you and it just, it's so calming because I'm not picking apart. What is my cat thinking? Right. <laughs> I think with animals, it's easier for me to, to just kind of relax and watch what they're doing and not overthink, you know, everything to that where, you know, in a profession where I have to constantly evaluate, what does this mean? What does that mean? And, um, you know, I, I it seems like you have that completely settled in yourself. You know, I can, I can see that. And it's, I think it's so important to, to kind of have that, so. Not completely at all, I ask my wife. <laughs> Let's not pretend I'm sitting here glowing. I am glowing, but it's because I'm paying attention right. and I'm present. Not when I'm anxious, I have to remind myself. Not when I'm angry, I have to remind myself. That's where Buddhism, so I want to go back to your initial question. Kashmir Shaivism and Buddhism, they inform me. Kashmir Shaivism was the experience I just gave you of sitting by a river and being, and there's no lens of meaning because the meaning maker is not in front of you. You're simply being with the universe living through itself and through you. There's no meaning needed. That's a non-dual perspective from Kashmir Shaivism or any non-dual tradition, meaning there's not two things going on. It's all one thing happening. Your awareness of it is included in that one thing happening. Buddhism from, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, is it when you're having that experience, is that how you kind of view your connection to source? The, it's no longer a connection to, because it's all living through you at the same very moment as your awareness. It's all coming from the same place. So it's not me having an experience of, it is the experience of source living itself through my perception, through my body, through the river, through the star. It's all living itself through that, uh, where I no longer have a me and a that. I love this because I think there's so many similarities between the philosophy of Buddhism and Christianity. I mean, just talking to you, you're all about service and your connection to source and I, I just think that's kind of lost and I think one of my goals kind of is just to bridge those gaps and kind of you know let people see what we have in common and that for sure that's a really lovely lovely goal for all of us because that's more dialogue and more understanding 
And then we can go, aha, together. Here's your language. Here's your thinking patterns. And boy, some of those are beautiful. And how can I have those experiences? And you can hear this going, how can I have some of those experiences? And I don't have to be like, well, you got to be a, a yogic person or a Buddhist. I'm like, you can. So I, one of my patients was a pastor in the Calvary Church, I believe. So he was, he's a pastor. He was. And we're talking, he came to me as a, as a Buddhist psychologist and, and wants a deeper connection for himself with, with God. So he came to me, which is ironic and amazing because he's open enough to see something was missing for him. And I asked him, what would it be like if he met Jesus, right? If he was able to, to walk to a space with Jesus, what would his experience be like? He goes, it would be amazing. I said, well, what, what's amazing about it? it? Would it be anything he says that changes you profoundly? He, he goes, no, no. It would just, being with him, I said, well, what do you imagine being with him would feel like? And he sits up, shoulders back. He would be radiant. Just being with him, I would feel at ease. I'd feel light. And I bet you he would be totally totally present with me i'm like that's that's an amazing what do you feel right now he goes i feel emotional and what else do you say inspired because because he wants to start living that way i said what would it take for you to embody that and you walk around and every person you meet you radiate the same way you would you would hope jesus would radiate in your in your own presence and that has never left him because that's what he wants most, and that's what he wants to give the most. So that's when we go from the external idea into the internal, and then we radiate that back out again. Because I believe him. Imagine him being in the presence of Jesus, the healing just around him because of presence itself. So what does it take for us to get there? And that's my job with every human being that walks into my office. What healing do you need? Where do you not feel whole, although you already are? And what's in your way of being that radiant presence that will heal everybody in its, in its proximity just by being near you? That's some of the work I do to awaken people. And then the Buddhism for me is about refining our speech, our behavior, our mind, so that we're acting, speaking, being compassionate, kind, firm, caring, understanding. Firm means we can still say no. That's not okay. But the way we say, no, it's not okay, makes a difference. So for me, Buddhism is how we refine our humanity and the Kashmir Shaivism is how we know who we truly are. You know, you talking about your different concepts and, and just how you, um, your take on the world and your purpose and um, I've gotten a lot out of this. This has been a great podcast. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Good to hear that, thank you. Any note you wanna leave the audience on? I say this now I'm saying this at the end of every single podcast because it's it's like my farewell note every single person listening is so both unique and a part of the greater whole and it's really important for me that people learn to love themselves not out of narcissism or feeling special but because this is maybe the only existence they get that looks just like this. We don't know what comes next or what happened before. We just, we just don't really know any of this. If this is it, this is precious. If this isn't it, it's still precious because we have a chance to do something with this body and mind, no matter what state we're in. Just because people have anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, or they're struggling with alcohol and drugs doesn't mean they have a full range of potential in a different way, um, in a unique set of ways. So I want people to know, one, take care of themselves because they deserve it and they're precious. And two, once you do that, find out who you are and live it to your fullest because it benefits all of us to do that. I'll just leave it with that. Oh, that's beautiful. So um, I guess, how can people find you and find out more about what you're doing? Uh, MichaelSapiro.com. They can go, because that has all my podcasts, my Dharma talks, 
I teach at Esalen Institute uh, in Big Sur, California. I lead retreats in Thailand and in Italy next year. Most of my talks are on my website and Instagram, Dr. Mike Boise. Uh, so Facebook, Dr. Mike Boise, and then my website are great places to get a hold of me. Awesome. Well, this was awesome. I love talking with you. Thank you guys so much for doing this and a lovely couple. I, I wish you uh, lots of success and learning a lot and sharing what you're learning. So.